You know, we've been looking at the doctrine of going instantly to heaven upon death the past two weeks. I promised last week that we would look at absent from the body, present with the Lord this week. Today, we will do that. But first, I'd like to try to lay some groundwork. How many of us witnessed the U.S. Civil War? No? Why not? Well, it could be because none of us existed then. We weren't alive at that time. We have no memory of anything before we were born. Well, what does it mean to be born? From the Free Dictionary Online, I'll give you the definition. To be born means to come into existence through birth. We simply didn't exist before we were born. That's why we don't remember anything before our birth. That makes sense. We weren't alive then. Now, actually, we need a body to have witnessed the Civil War, or anything else for that matter. But we didn't have one at that time. Now, since our birth, we've seen things, we've heard things, we've experienced things. When we die, we return to the state we were in prior to our birth. We can't see. We can't hear. We know nothing. We don't just keep on going as some try to tell us. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. You would turn to Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. What do the dead know? Do the dead have memories of before they died? Do they know what's going on all around them after they die? Now, many of our leaders tell us that we just continue on to death. We don't stop. Let's see what happens here. Uh, they say that we don't forget a thing. We continue to see and hear what's going on around us. Now, all of us know that one day we will die. But what will we know after we die? What does our Bible say? Again, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. For the living know they shall die, but the dead know what? Not anything. The dead know not anything. Turn to Isaiah 38, verse 18, if you would. Isaiah 38, verse 18. Now, am I saying that when we die, we aren't instantly in heaven, praising, in heaven praising God? We're not sitting around God's throne singing praises to Him? Is that what I'm saying? Let's see what Isaiah says in chapter 38, verse 18. This is from the King James Version. For the grave cannot praise you. Death cannot celebrate you. They that go down into the pit, or the grave, cannot hope for your truth. I'll reread that, if you like, in the easy-to-read version. The dead cannot praise you. People in Sheol, meaning the grave, cannot sing praises to you. Those who have died and gone below are not trusting in your faithfulness. That's because the dead are dead. They know nothing. So we knew nothing before we were born because we didn't exist. We had to be born to exist. We had to have a birth. Now when we die, we cease to exist again. We know not anything. So how do we come back into existence? Well, we must be born again. Now, other people say that they're born again. They say this when they make a profession of faith or perhaps of baptism. Now, we might say that we become a new man or a new woman in the sense that we behave differently and our focus changes. We've made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. But there is no actual birth. We don't come into existence from non-existence. And if we no longer exist after death, we then must be born again to exist after we die. So how are we born again? Must we be born of a mother's womb again? Let's turn to John 3, verse 1. That's John chapter 3, verse 1. Well, fortunately for us, Nicodemus asked Jesus this very question. Let's see how Jesus answered him. Again, John 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. We know from the last couple of weeks that the Pharisees were often at odds with Jesus. But this particular Pharisee respected Christ. Verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. It appears that Nicodemus recognized Jesus as being sent by God. He wanted to hear more from Jesus. 
Now, most likely, he didn't want the other Pharisees to see him talking to Christ. They certainly would not have approved of that. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus said we must be born again to see the kingdom. Now, unlike Martha and the thief on the cross, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, had been drawn away to false doctrines by the other Pharisees. We talked about the thief on the cross last week. We'll talk about Martha in just a few minutes. But let's go to verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, Nicodemus had the right idea. We do have to be born a second time. But Nicodemus didn't understand what Jesus was talking about. He only knew of one way to be born. That was the way of a birth by a mother, a woman. We can see that in verse 4. But was Adam born of a woman? The first Adam was not born of a woman. His body was created directly by God. And what about Christ himself? We know he was born to a woman, but then he was born again. His second birth was not from the womb. Adam, the first man, was born or came into existence in a physical body. It wasn't a spirit body. And Adam was not born of a woman. And when Christ was resurrected, he was given a spirit body. He was born again because Christ had already been born once of a woman. The second time Christ was not born of a woman. Now Nicodemus didn't understand that Christ can give us new bodies, either physical bodies or spirit bodies, without the need to be born from a woman's womb. In fact, everyone we see in the Bible that was resurrected or born again was not born of a woman, although all were born from the womb the first time. Nicodemus apparently did not understand this. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's because those born of flesh and blood only cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We can also read about that back in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. I guess that's forward. But notice in verse 6 that Jesus tells us that either we're born of flesh or we're born of spirit. There is no hybrid. Jesus tells us in the very next verse that we can be one or the other. But no one can be born of the flesh, the physical body, and the spirit, the spirit body, at the same time. We can be born to either, but not to both simultaneously. Verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, nothing else. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said to you, you must be born again. Or as some translations put it, don't be surprised that I told you, you must be born again. We must be born again because we must be given spirit bodies to reside in God's kingdom once it's fully established. But for those that believe we are spirit now and have no need to be born again into a spirit body in the future, let's look at verse 8. John 3, verse 8. The wind blows where it lists, and you can hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes or where it goes. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, Jesus just described every one born of the Spirit. And we know we must be born of the Spirit to enter the kingdom. Jesus tells us that if we are born of the Spirit, we can come and go. But no one can tell from where we came or where we went. You might recall that Jesus, after his resurrection, after he was born again with a spirit body, he just appeared to his disciples in a room with all the doors shut. And you can read about that in John 20, verse 19. And then Jesus was having a meal with his disciples in Luke 24, verse 12. Suddenly, he vanished out of their sight. Jesus, with his spirit body, could just appear and disappear. We couldn't tell from where he came or where he went. The only other body we can possess, according to Jesus, is a body of flesh and blood, which is exactly what all humans have today. Now, can we just appear and disappear? Can we appear in a room with all the doors shut? Well, if not, then we do not possess a spirit body. Not according to Christ, not at this time. 
and not until such time as we are born again into that spirit body. Now, I know what many of us have been taught, and I know we grew up believing other things than this. And at this point, we might all be asking ourselves, how can these things be? Well, Nicodemus, being taught to be a Pharisee, had the exact same reaction. Verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? But Nicodemus reminds me very much of those today who begin to suspect that what they've been taught might not always be true. Verse 10. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a master of Israel and know not these things? Or as the Good News Bible puts it, Jesus answered, You are a great teacher in Israel, and you don't know this? Verse 11. Verily, verily, I say to you, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and you receive not our witness. Jesus is telling Nicodemus that he, Jesus, has been speaking the truth, but Nicodemus would not receive what Jesus was telling him. Nicodemus, as well as the rest of the Pharisees, wouldn't listen to Christ. Verse 12. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? I'll read that again in the contemporary English version. If you don't believe when I talk to you about things on earth, how can you possibly believe if I talk to you about things in heaven? Do we believe what Jesus said, what he says, when he speaks to us from our Bibles? Are we sure? Do we believe what we read in this very next verse of our Bibles? Well, if not, will we ever be able to understand heavenly things? Verse 13. And no man, I'm going to stop here for a second. The phrase no man here is the Greek word odice. It's G3762 in Strong's, and it means not even one man, woman, or thing. That is none, nobody, nothing. That's the definition of that phrase, no man, there in John 3.13. So let's read it again. So basically, no man, no woman, or thing has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Could Jesus have been any more clear than that? Nothing. No man, woman, or thing has ever gone to heaven except Christ himself. I believe this completely blows the lid off the idea that anyone has ever gone straight to heaven upon death. Jesus clearly says that no one, nor even, even anything, has gone to heaven except himself. Now like Nicodemus, if we don't believe what Christ tells us in John 3.13, we'll never be able to truly understand heavenly things. Last week we looked at the story of the thief on the cross as he and Jesus conversed. Let's look at another event in our Bibles today, and that would be the death and resurrection of Lazarus. So if you would, let's turn over to John 11, verse 11. That's John chapter 11 and verse 11. Now, early in chapter 11, Lazarus had become sick and he died. But after the death of Lazarus, Jesus described Lazarus as being asleep. Jesus considered the dead to be asleep because in both cases, we're not conscious, but will be awakened in the future. Those that literally sleep at night might be awakened by an alarm clock. That obviously won't work for the dead, but Christ can wake them up. Christ can resurrect them back to life. And Jesus went to awaken or resurrect Lazarus from his sleep. Let's pick up the story where Jesus announces to his disciples that Lazarus is dead. Jesus tells his disciples that Lazarus sleeps. John 11, verse 11. These things said he, and after that he said to them, the disciples, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they, his disciples, thought that he had spoken of taking of rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So Jesus traveled to where Lazarus was buried, and Lazarus had been dead for four days by then, before he arrived. Verse 20. 
Go to verse 20 if you would. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever you will ask of God, God will give it to you. Jesus said to her, your brother shall rise again. Did Jesus tell Martha that Lazarus was in heaven? No. Rather, Jesus assured Mar uh, Martha that Lazarus would rise again, or awake from his sleep, as Jesus calls it. Did Martha argue with Jesus? Did she tell Jesus that Lazarus was looking down on the two of them from heaven? No. Martha knew that Lazarus was asleep, waiting for his resurrection at the appointed time, just as Jesus said. Verse 24. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Martha knew her brother would rise or be born again at his resurrection in the future. Verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Shall live in the future. Not that he would be alive or conscious while he was dead. Jesus told Martha that although Lazarus was dead, he would live again. Martha obviously knew this, but she never expected Jesus would resurrect Lazarus right then and there. But where was Lazarus during all this? If we all go to heaven when we die, then Lazarus should have been in heaven, but he wasn't. Jesus found him at his place of burial. Verse 38. Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, came to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Said I not to you that if you would believe, you should see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. And I knew that you hear me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a napkin. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Lazarus slept until he was born a second time. He came into existence a second time, but he had no knowledge of what transpired while he was dead. During that time, he knew not anything. Jesus woke Lazarus from his sleep. Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead. Do we see Lazarus exclaiming about what he'd seen in heaven? No, because he never went there. Turn over to Job 14, verse 12, if you would. Let's look over there. Job uh, chapter 14, verse 12. Let's see what Job has to say about what happens when one dies. When one dies. Will Job tell us that we go to heaven immediately upon death? Or will he tell us something different? Well, we find Job is talking to God here in verse 12. Again, Job 14, verse 12. So man lies down and rises not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake or be raised out of their sleep. Does Job remind us of what Jesus just told us before he resurrected Lazarus? Job says a man lies down and doesn't get up. In other words, he's dead. But notice how Job describes death as sleep. He says we won't be awakened from that sleep. At least not like we're regularly awake from our nightly sleep anyway. Verse 13. The next verse. Oh, that you would hide me in the grave, that you would keep me secret until your wrath be past, that you would appoint me a set time and remember me. Job asked God to give him safety in his grave until God's wrath is over. Afterward, he's asking God to remember him. Remember him when? After God's wrath is passed. What happens? God's kingdom will be established. Job is asking God to remember him when his kingdom is established. 
And that's practically identical to what the thief on the cross asked Jesus. We saw that last time. The thief on the cross, Job, and even Martha all understood what Christ taught. That there would be resurrections of the dead when the kingdom comes. Until then, the dead sleep. Verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? Job understands that we don't just keep on going at death. He asks the rhetorical question, shall we live again? And answers his own question, continuing in verse 14. All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Job says he will wait until his change comes, until he's given a new body, until he's born again. Now, I promised last week that we would examine the claim that I've heard over and over again. I've heard this from many, many prominent TV evangelists. And very often when I suggest we don't actually go to heaven immediately upon death, the rebuttal is swift, and more often than not, it's always the same response. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Hear it all the time. Or, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, this is taught as if it were a direct quote from Scripture. Most people believe it is. Now, I can understand pastors being deceived or simply misunderstanding Scripture. But I believe this is different. This is an intentionally incorrect paraphrase of what the Scripture actually says. And that's why it's so very important that we always read the Scriptures for ourselves. Because nowhere in our Bibles does it say, absent from the body, present with the Lord, or to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's not there. Anyone tells you it is, well, they're, they're lying to you. Why would they do that? Well, I'll let all of us answer that question for ourselves. Let's go take a look at this proof that we go to heaven immediately at death. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. To examine the claim that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Remember what we've seen. We today are flesh and blood. As such, we cannot enter the spirit realm, not without being born again, into a spirit body. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 6. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Is Paul speaking the truth in verse 6? Well, of course he is. While we're flesh and blood, we cannot be spirit. And while we're physical beings, we cannot go to be the Christ in the spirit realm. There's nothing surprising there. Let's look at verse 8. Verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's what the Bible actually says. What is Paul saying here? Now, Paul knows that he cannot be in the Lord's presence as long as he's been born of flesh and blood and remains a physical being. Paul knows he cannot be present with the Lord until he is born into a spirit body. And he's willing to lose his physical body in order to be reborn into a spirit body, something he knows is necessary to be in Christ's presence. But did he say that if he died, he would be instantly in heaven? No, he never said that. That's just men twisting scriptures to try and support a false doctrine that has no solid support no matter where we look in our Bibles. Let's say, for example, that today, uh, let's say I desire to be in a church building with all the brethren surrounding me. So what if I made a statement like this? I'm willing to be absent from my home, to be present with all of you in that church building. Well, obviously, I can't be in two places at the same time. I would have to leave my home to be a church, just as Paul knows he can't be in a physical body and a spirit body at the same time. He must leave one to be born into the other. Now, if you stopped by my house and I wasn't home, would that be irrefutable proof that I was in the church building? Well, no. I could be anywhere. I might be the grocery store. Maybe I went for a walk. Maybe I don't exist anymore. But being absent from my home doesn't mean I am in any specific place. Suppose it was Monday, 
and there were no services at church that day. I might leave my house, but it would be impossible to be in the church with the brethren because I would be there before the appointed time for the church service. Now, all Paul is saying is that he is willing to lose his physical body in order to be reborn in his spirit body at his resurrection. At the time appointed for him by God. He understood that he would not have both a physical and a spirit being at the same time. It can't be both. Okay, I'll get it right. <laughs> he understood he couldn't be both a physical being and a spirit at the same time. He would have to be changed. But there is no implication that his change was immediate. How long was Lazarus dead before he was resurrected? Who knows? Four days. How about Christ? Three days and three nights. Neither went to heaven immediately. It's like the thief on the cross understood. He wouldn't be in heaven the same day with Christ. And like Job, all the days of my appointed time, I wait till my change come. Paul understood that he would not be in heaven the same day he died. Paul also will wait all the days of his appointed time till his change comes, until he is born again. And Paul is saying, all Paul is saying, is he would be willing to lose his physical body in order to be reborn in a spirit body at his resurrection at the time appointed for him by God. How long will it be between Paul's physical death and his resurrection to a spirit being? Paul didn't know. We don't know either. Only the Father knows. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord is a blatant and intentional misrepresentation of what Paul was saying. And in my opinion, it's a very poor attempt to prove a false doctrine that cannot be proven from our Bibles. In fact, our Bibles prove something very different. And this is just one of the many attempts that rely on speculation as well as outright twisting of the Scripture to prove a false doctrine. For the past three weeks, we've looked at some of the proofs that the dead go to heaven or hell immediately upon death. We saw that the story of Lazarus and a rich man never mentioned the word heaven. The word hell that appeared there was the Greek word Hades, which simply means the grave. The meaning of this story is often debated. This story has the characteristics of a parable, a type of fictitious story that Jesus often used to make a point. In fact, this story followed several other parables. Jesus said he spoke in parables to conceal their meaning from the world, which might explain the confusion as to the actual meaning of Lazarus and the rich man, if it indeed is a parable, as I highly suspect. And as such, it actually supports the resurrections versus the immortal soul going to heaven immediately upon death. We looked at the thief on the cross, where many teach that Jesus promised the thief that the two of them would be in heaven that very day. But upon close examination, we saw that the thief was asking Jesus to remember him in his future kingdom. And Jesus said he would. But that was the future. We know that both the thief and Jesus didn't go to heaven that day because Jesus told Mary three days and three nights later that he still had not ascended to heaven. And Jesus does not lie. Job asked God to keep him in his grave until God's wrath was over and his kingdom was established. Job wasn't expecting to die and go instantly to heaven. We have no memory of what happened before we were born. That's because we weren't alive then. We need to be alive to experience the world around us. We saw that to come into existence where we can experience things, we need to be born. The definition of being born means that we come into existence from non-existence. We saw that Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, says that the dead know not anything. The prophet Isaiah told us that the dead cannot praise God. The dead cannot sing praises to him. Jesus told Nicodemus that he had to be born again to see the kingdom. That's because Nicodemus was a physical human being. He has to be born again as a spirit being before he can enter the kingdom of God. Jesus also said that flesh is flesh and spirit is spirit. He said that a spirit being can just appear and disappear. Something no human today can do 
proving that we don't have spirit bodies today, but rather only physical bodies. Being born into a physical body does not allow us to go be with Christ right now. But being born again as a spirit being would allow us to be with Jesus. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, he must be born again. An actual birth. Nicodemus thought to be born again meant to be born of a woman a second time. But we know that Lazarus was resurrected or born again, but was not born of a woman, not the second time. For that matter, neither was Christ born of a woman the second time. And we saw that Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the grave. But Jesus didn't go to heaven or a burning hell to find Lazarus. He went to where Lazarus was laid to rest. And of course, we looked at John 3, verse 13, where we saw that no man, no woman, nor even anything has ever gone to heaven except for Christ himself. The evidence for the future resurrections and that we don't go to heaven instantly when we die has overwhelming biblical support. The evidence that we go to heaven immediately at death, well, that's actually non-existent. Its support is based on speculation, misunderstanding of the scriptures, and even an intentional altering of the words of the Bible as we've seen today. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He likely came to Jesus that night because he didn't want to be seen. He didn't want his peers to see him with Jesus because they rejected what Christ said. What if Nicodemus was seen talking to a radical? One whose teaching didn't line up with what the Pharisees taught. I think Nicodemus was risking a lot that night. But he wanted to hear from Jesus because he was eager to hear the truth from Christ himself. Rather than be content to follow the traditions of the Pharisees, the traditions of men. I'd say it took a certain amount of courage for Nicodemus to meet with Jesus that night. And it always has, and it always will, take great courage and dedication to follow Jesus Christ. Following the traditions of men is easy. Following Christ is not always that easy. But the rewards are eternal.